Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. And you can always find Let's Talk Micro on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, TuneIn Radio, Good Pods. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. As far as social media, I am on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube as Let's Talk Micro, on X as Let's Talk Micro 1, LinkedIn as Luis Plaza, and I have an email address, which is Let's Talk Micro at Outlook.com, where you can send any feedback, any suggestions. So please subscribe to the podcast, download episodes, leave a review if the app allows you to do so. As always, you know, I am grateful for the support and any suggestions, any feedback, they are always welcome and appreciated. And if you haven't checked out the latest episode, please go ahead and do so. It was the second part of a great conversation about emerging viruses with Dr. Ryan Relich and Dr. Benjamin Pinsky. And in this episode, they talk about diagnostics, you know, lab testing, the challenges that they are with developing tests, and they give their views on um, viruses and outbreaks. So both episodes are great, you know, uh, from... The first one was about, you know, breaking down, you know, DNA viruses, RNA viruses, diseases, mode of entry. And then this one, this last one about, you know, testing. So definitely, you know, check both of them out if you haven't done so already. It was a very educational episode and I had a great time recording it. You know, their, their chemistry and their passion, you know, it was amazing. So please check it out. So today's episode is one that I have wanted to do for a long time and I finally you know, was able to and it's, it is about veterinary microbiology. So this was a great episode where Kelly Maddock and Sarah Geffro from the other two medical laboratory scientists that work in a veterinary lab. So they are from the North Dakota State University Veter Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And they came to the podcast to talk about veterinary micro, you know, that we talk about susceptibilities, the CLSI, um, you know, I asked the question, you know, what led them to choose, you know, working in a veterinary lab. And, you know, Kelly had an interesting answer, which was about that she was experiencing burnout, which is very, something very unfortunate, but very real that happens in this field, you know, with all the work we get and sometimes, you know, we're on their staff, the volume. So... It's a very unfortunate reality of this profession that I hope that we can alleviate. But it was definitely, uh, you know, it was such a great episode, you know, seeing, you know, the, what they're doing, you know, the workup of cultures, talking about the organism, susceptibilities. And something very interesting that was said in, the, in this episode is that, you know, if you think about human medicine, right, so if we, we have some sort of infection, we immediately go to the hospital pretty much, right? And we are seen and they collect a sample. And then as microbiologists, we get that sample is, you know, relatively fresh, right? You know, the infection hasn't been going on for a long time. So we get to work them, but with, you know, right away, but with uh, veterinary medicine, you know, sometimes, you know, the animal has been, you know, has been dead for a couple of days and then, and then the sample is collected. So that is something that they had to account for when they're working cultures, you know, they have some environmental factors. So you know, the organisms that are present, you know, whether they've, you know, they've been there or they got them from the environment. So, you know, it has its challenges. Um, but it was definitely a, a great episode, you know, very educational and I enjoy recording it. And I hope that you enjoy it as well. So let's go ahead and listen to it. As medical laboratory scientists, you know, we can go to many areas as you know, we work, we have, we can go to some of us go into education, some people go to industry. So there are many options. And then maybe you have heard about maybe what about veterinary, you know, uh, performing as a medical laboratory scientist in a veterinary lab? Um, what about veterinary microbiology? So today with me, I have two guests that are going to be talking about that. With me, I have Kelly Maddock and Sarah Greffero from the North Dakota State University. Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Kelly and Sarah, welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. My pleasure. So let's go ahead and, and start with a quick introduction. 
I'm Kelly Maddock. I'm section head of the microbiology and biosafety level three laboratories at the North Dakota Un State University Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Um, do a little bit of everything here. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in veterinary microbiology and veterinary medicine in general for a medical laboratory scientist. Um, my bachelor's is in medical laboratory science and my master's is as well. Um, I have both human and veterinary experience. Uh, and because of that, I feel like I've gained a lot of interest and perspective in One Health and public health. So uh, in 2021, I started my doctorate in public health at the University of South Florida. So I'm currently in progress with that, hoping to graduate in May of 2024. And my name is Sarah Geffro. I'm a diagnostic microbiologist here at the Vet Diagnostic Lab. And um, I guess like that implies, I work in the microbiology lab. We do parasitology, and my micro, mycology, all of the things that come with um, uh, microbiology. I also help Kelly in the Biosafety Level 3 laboratory as well. Well, you know, welcome again, and thank you so much for taking the time. You know, it's 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 a pleasure having you both here. And I was telling, uh, I was talking to Kelly before we started, you know, like I'm, and the audience can see this, but on the background, she has the ASM books. So really, you know, great resources. So definitely, if you're working in this field, I, you know, I invite you to definitely check them out and get as familiar with them as you can, because they are very helpful and they contain a great deal of information. Okay, so... Before we go on on about, you know, uh, you know, we start talking about what you do in the lab. So let's start with the first question. So what led you to work in a, in a veterinary lab? For me personally, I was experiencing burnout and I was at the point of looking at becoming an accountant <laughs> because there were some free opportunities for extra education there. Loved laboratory work, but I was so burnt out um, working where I was working. Uh, and I met a veterinary microbiologist at a public health uh, biosafety level three select agent training. And she encouraged me to watch for open positions. And I was initially hired on at the veterinary diagnostic lab in uh, 2015 as a diagnostic molecular uh, microbiologist. And because I had an interest in pretty much all areas and naturally as a med tech, I am nosy. <laughs> So asked a lot of questions and was willing to try testing in multiple sections. And it just kind of morphed from there. Um, it This field is perfect for anyone who has lots of questions and has an interest in animals, I think. I literally learn something new every day. And for me, I guess I started in the human realm as well um, with you know my degree in MLS. I worked at um, a pretty large size microbiology lab for about 15 years. 10 of which um, I served as an education coordinator um, for an MLS internship program. And I love my profession and I like to share um, information about our profession. Um, so that was very rewarding to me. But as the years went on, I found that I also wanted to have an opportunity to learn a different aspect or a different perspective of MLS. Um, so I knew Kelly well, and she encouraged me to give this a try. Um, I, so about three years ago, I came over here to veterinary land and um, it's been great. There's always something new to learn. Um, a lot of different aspects um, that you can incorporate in your day-to-day -day work um, that have been very rewarding. Yeah, that that's that's great to hear. And and Kelly, that's an unfortunate yeah thing that happens in in this field too. You know, we definitely have a lot of a lot of work. You know, we're dealing with issues, right? On awareness of the profession, staffing, and and for the audience, you know, even as, as MLS is, you know, sometimes in microbiology we have this issue where, let's say, like if you work in hematology or chemistry, right? You you work first shift and then you end, and the person that's taking over in the second shift, they have the same training as you do, pretty much. So you can just turn over the work. In micro, sometimes, you know, the flow, it's a lot different. And most of the readers and cultures, you know, they're on first shift. And the person that comes to relieve you on second shift, they don't have the same training. So that means that you're kind of stuck with all your workload for that day before you go home. So 
very challenging to complete it in eight hours. You know, it's typically nine, sometimes, you know, 10. And that unfortunately is leads to a lot of burnout and we lose a lot of people. So it's something that we definitely need to address and continue working on. Okay. So as far as, you know, I met people in my career that sometimes, you know, they had some experience working, you know, like I, I met someone that worked in a, for a zoo. I met someone that graduated our program and then she went on to, after a year or so to go into SeaWorld. But as far as the education, you know, requirements to work as an MLS in a veterinary lab, they're the same for us as long as you complete a, an accredited program for medical laboratory sciences, you're able to work in a, in a veterinary lab. Is that correct? Well, actually, uh, as a medical laboratory scientist, you are very well suited to make the transition. Um, minimum requirements. Uh, so veterinary laboratories are accredited, but they aren't um, accredited by like CLIA or CAP. It's the American Association of Veterinary Laboratory Diagnosticians, and they may also uh, look at ISO accreditation, uh, the 17.025, depending on what sort of testing they do. Uh, so it, from that AAVLD accreditation requirements, um, most requirements just indicate that a four-year degree in some kind of um, biological or chemical science is required uh, for section heads and other uh, roles. For instance, we work with veterinary pathologists. Obviously, the person should be a veterinarian who is trained as a pathologist and boarded in that respect or highly skilled toxicologist who's a veterinarian with additional chemical training or chemistry training. Um, so there are minimum requirements, uh, but usually a four-year degree would set you up for it. But an MLS is really uniquely poised to just jump in and learn more species. So human medicine, we learn so much about humans and what our normal ranges are and uh, the ins and outs of diagnostic testing. But in animals, you have to consider all of the different animal species. Um, so it isn't just your dogs and cats. You think I have to think about cattle small ruminants, exotic animals. Um, we never really know what we're going to see in a single day. So you also have to be aware of um, the oddball things that you learn about in your training. So um, a lot to consider. Sarah, would you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Kelly, too, but um, by having MLS personnel here on staff, it allowed... Um, our veterinary diagnostic lab to then kind of bridge that gap during COVID testing. We were able to, um, you know, attain a CLIA certification so that we were able to help out with human testing or overflow testing for our state health lab. Um, so while an MLS was not required, it has served as a great benefit for our region um, in many aspects. Yes. And for that human COVID testing, we did require medical laboratory scientists because North Dakota is a um, licensure, state. licensure state. Yes. Um, but because we uh, were trained and appropriately licensed, we could jump in and help and that better serving public health. But other states across the United States where they might not have had those requirements still also jumped in and did help with that overflow testing, too. Okay. And um, so now that, you know, you mentioned the different ranges and so we know as, right, we complete a, a let's say a medical laboratory sciences program and any job that we start you know, requires training. So now that you mentioned that, so it's basically, you know, we go to school and then the ranges that we learn, you know, they're more for a human population and we go into the job and training can take sometimes, you know, a month, maybe longer, depending on where you are micro. A lot of times, you know, it can be longer. So how long is the training? Like if someone makes the switch to a veterinary lab, how long does it, you know, the, does the person get trained before they can start working on their own? I think it's very tech dependent. Um, you know, if, if you have a significant background already in human testing um, for microbiology specifically, you know, sample prep and specimen processing is the same incubation conditions, all of those kind of little nuances are the same. Um, the learning curve for me came into play where um, there are a few different um, animal pathogens to learn um, that we don't see in human medicine. Um, for me, it 
it was pretty easy to make um, a comparison. So for example, say in humans, Haemophilus influenza could be a common respiratory sinus ear type pathogen. You know, the an equivalent in veterinary medicine might be Histophilus. So there, there, there are equivalent like organisms um, that you can draw that correlation to that help you learn quicker. Um, so really training, I mean, aside from reading your policies and being signed off on your competencies, um, you know, uh, it, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, it very much depends on which department you jumped into. Sarah came to us with incredible experience and years and years of training. So she picked up on things very quickly and was able to help with things almost instantly. But I know for me personally, even with um, both molecular and micro experience, I was shell shocked when I switched over to uh, the molecular diagnostics. In human medicine, we have so many tests that are FDA approved and here's this kit and it pops up the result and you don't really have much for troubleshooting. Well, most of our tests, because we are looking for very specific pathogens for different animal species are laboratory developed. So you really end up becoming quite the expert um, at, you know, your tests very, very well. So you do get very skilled. Um, and something else for training too, that I know neither of us had a whole lot was um, media preparation. There was a lot of media that we prepared. Um, I think Sarah picked up on it pretty quickly, but I, I think that was kind of a whole a whole new animal that <laughs> neither of us had, had done much with. Okay. Yeah. It, it makes sense. And it's, you know, especially like in, in micro, you know, the, the organisms are the organisms, like you said, you know, learning some that are specific to the, to animals. Um, and also, you know, I would think just right shifting your thoughts and then about you know so what's pathogenic versus what's normal flora and some of those we're we're even familiar with right so we know about pastorella we know about salmonella but then when it comes to that specific animal you know it's different it's part of their flora so i definitely i i see that so now that we're talking about uh testing so uh what type of testing do you perform so our laboratory is really well known for toxicology um we have a an incredible boarded um, toxicologist that works here. Uh, but we also have a very wide complement of molecular diagnostic tests, um, different cultures, uh, serology, uh, virology. As Sarah mentioned, we have parasitology. Um, and because we have pathologists and we serve our state, um, we also perform necropsies, which are animal autopsies. And so we're getting a lot of testing from that versus just uh, clinical samples being sent in. Also a key component to our um, facility as a whole is rabies testing. Um, we are mandated to do that. And um, that's one of the primary reasons we exist, I guess, is to provide rabies testing for animals within our state. Yes, that's written within our century code is we must exist to perform diagnostic testing and rabies. Very good point. Yeah, definitely. Right. So um, so what about in micro, as far as, you know, what kind of instruments, uh, do you have over there? I mean, if anything, or is it pretty much, you know, you use the same, and I'm kind of just mentioning because I kind of asked someone that was working at SeaWorld and then they mentioned, right, that they even had you know an instrument and this is enough, it's not an endorsement or anything, but like the Vitec, you know, they had a Vitec and they, they used it. And so it just makes me curious about what kind of instruments do you use in, in the micro lab? Yeah, I think we use, um, I mean, instruments that you'd be familiar with. We we have a mass spec for the majority of our identifications. Um, we have a reader for AST panels. Um, we we are uh, in the midst of bringing in a Vitec, um, but I I view this as kind of one of those great opportunities in vet med as a place where we can advocate for change and improvements. Um, we know there's all kinds of automated and fancy instruments that we can use in human medicine and diagnostics, and they could easily be adapted for veterinary use. Um, they just aren't yet. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of some an area, I guess, that I feel Kelly and I are a bit more vocal about. 
um, prompting some changes in that realm. Yes, we really, vendors, there's a lot of opportunity in veterinary microbiology and veterinary medicine in general. We're always looking for tools and a lot of times you have to adapt, but very simple tweaks with a lot of common instruments would really be major life improvements. Okay. So what's basically what's, so there's the, the, the gap is very significant between what's out there for, for human medicine versus veterinary medicine. And that's something that needs to be worked on. Yeah, I would mention uh, one thing we are very acutely aware of that we're in a very resource limited setting. Like we are very cost conscious. Uh, so we, we can't throw $700 at a really fancy test panel for someone's dog that, that has to be affordable for them or for a producer who has an entire herd of animals. Um, it's not practical in most situations to test them. So we have to be very selective and conscientious of what we're choosing for our test methods. And so then adapting that there is, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Okay. Um, so, and then I just want to ask about cultures, right? I'm definitely, that's a, still is a big part, even though in microbiology, you know, in clinical micro, a lot of, you know, molecular, you know, keeps making huge leaps and bounds and, but we still do culture. So maybe can we, can we talk about some of the cultures if you do any over there and maybe give an example of what a, a workup would be, you know, based on what the animals, you know, uh, normal flora will be versus the pathogens, what you're expecting there? Um, I guess I would say we have, we perform all the same types of cultures um, that you would in, you would encounter in a human lab. Um, along with the very similar workflow, um, a, you know, when, when you say you're growing a culture from a lung, a respiratory sample. Um, it's still the same. You evaluate your growth um, and you determine or separate your normal flora from your pathogens. Um, normal flora is normal flora. Um, there's there's always, you know, the, the alpha streps that are normal and there's, you know, uh, weird types of Neisseria and Haemophilus that are normal. Um, in most of our animal species. Um, but the the kind of unique component to many of our samples is that um, we don't necessarily get our samples uh, immediately after collection. Um, sometimes maybe an animal has been out in a pasture for a day or two before, you know, the owner finds it and decides to send a sample in. Um, to determine a cause of death. Um, so we wind up separating out a lot of environmental contamination um, and, you know, um, situational bacteria that might show up from older samples. Um, and to, so it just adds another layer to our cultures. Not only are you determining normal flora from pathogens, but you're also separating out environmental contaminants. Another bit that thankfully we don't experience as much in animals. Uh, think of how an animal uses their tongue and how much that can um, impact interpreting a wound or an eyeball. <laughs> so it really makes it interesting to interpret some of those, that flora too, but that post-mortem overgrowth or suboptimal sample conditions does really, it makes the interpretation more challenging sometimes. Oh, that's, that's, that's very interesting. You know, like I, yeah, because normally we find like that type of unusual, you know, thinking about respiratory flora. And then we see, right. When we think about Ikenella and we talked about, right. A human bite or, or sometimes we see between, you know, uh, little kids, you know, and siblings that one will bite the other. And then you get respiratory flora, let's say on the arm or the forehead, you know, I, you've seen that. So definitely you, would you have to account for that? And then, yeah, definitely the environmental factor, uh, you know, it's not like us, right? We, we see something wrong, we go get seen right away for the most part. And so those samples are fresh and we start working right away with them. So you have that extra, that extra challenge. And then you mentioned um, susceptibilities. Um, can you talk more about that? I mean, what do you typically do? Go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Uh, yeah, susceptibility testing. Um we do broth microdilution primarily. 
Uh, we are looking more into actually picking up more Kirby Bauer disk diffusion um, and e-test. Uh, we are also, as Sarah had previously mentioned, we're working on bringing a Vitec in. Um, the antimicrobials, again, they vary by the animal species. What is approved for a companion animal is not the same as for a food animal. And part of that are regulations um, through the FDA on what is appropriate for a food animal to consume. There are certain antibiotics that they'll, um, they should never consume, such as like an aminoglycoside. Um, so that will vary quite a bit based on those species. Um, both Sarah and I are involved with uh, the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute on the Veterinary Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing Committee. Um, so we are part of the standards developing group for us. Um, VETO 1S is the analogous um, document that you use um, M100, it's analogous to M100. So we would use that similarly. And um, that document is an animal in itself, M100, uh, but VETA1, VETA1S has so much to learn and there are so many little factors you have to consider um, when selecting the right antimicrobials for the animals. And something that differs, so we're used to getting um, samples directly, usually from like in your hospital system. So there's specific information you have. You have formularies of drugs that you're testing regularly. So you, you have those expectations. We have to, um, as a laboratory, independently select which antimicrobials we're routinely going to test and provide a client. We don't know if the animal has pyelonephritis. So is it appropriate to report a fluoroquinolone and allow the clinician to have that freedom and judgment? or, you know, versus the hospital system, which might say susceptible to these lactams or combination agents, then you don't get X, Y, and Z. So there's um, some of those challenges associated. So it's, it's a very complex process. And Sarah, definitely add to that, please. Yeah, no, I, to me, and I've, or susceptibility testing is really fascinating in general, right? Um, you know, we can, we can tell a physician or a veterinarian a whole host of antibiotics that may or may not work in the human land. Um, but for veterinary medicine, not only do we not have um, guidelines or breakpoints for all species and organism combinations, but each animal may metabolize a drug differently. And so I mean, there's all of these different factors that are out there um, that we, you know, again, may or may not have um, the benefit of working with a veterinary pharmacologist and a veterinarian. Um, so, you know, we do the best we can um, with the drugs that are available in veterinary medicine and um, the testing options we have that encompass those drugs. Um, but it's definitely a work in progress. Okay. Yeah. And I, I see that. I mean, yeah, as far as, as I think about it with the, yeah, you know, the drugs that are already there and they're using human medicine, you know, they have already their, their mechanism of action. So it's, you know, it's thinking definitely about breakpoints and how that particular animal will met metabolize that and how it's different and will it be okay. So yeah, there's definitely more, yeah, more to, to learn, it seems. Is there anything else I know that you, you know, perhaps had mentioned about any stories? I know that on veterinary medicine, you deal with, right, you know, you talked about rabies and sometimes, you know, with animals, we see, right, anthrax, uh, we see plague. So, and do you have any, any stories like that, anything that you have worked with or anything to share with the audience? Yes. So as medical laboratory scientists, we know we train to see anthrax. We train to be able to recognize Yersinia pestis and tularemia. But um, I had no appreciation for anthrax being endemic in North Dakota and um, uh, until working here and just how frequently it's seen. We're currently in the midst of an anthrax outbreak in the state. Uh, it's localized to a particular county. Uh, so we identified that using a PCR assay, we would have the ability to culture, but just for safety's sake, we wouldn't. Uh, we've also seen a lot of tularemia this year too, um, in cats primarily. Um, anthrax, you end up seeing in cattle 
um, or other ruminant species like goats. So um, there's just always something different. And I know Sarah has also experienced the joy of just pathogens you never really expect to see very often, like listeria. Um, and just seeing that out of a sample on a routine basis is always just really interesting. Um, there's just always something new. Yeah, right. I mean, like you mentioned, we are, we, you know, we train for it, we get tested every year, we you know, we get the survey where we get some samples with some case studies. And, and the thing is, you know, like, most of us working in a lab, and, and gratefully, so of course, right, we probably go our whole careers without ever on uh, the human population working with anthrax or, or the Yersinia pestis, you know, we just, we'll see that that sample. And that's a good thing, right? Maybe the most we get exposed to, you know, we seen, you know, we get brucella in the lab and maybe some francisella, but that that's about it. So that well, that's like a yeah, like working with it and seeing so much, you know, it has to be an experience. And and I mean good that you work with it on a on a PCR. I mean, it'll be kind of like shocking, right? Seeing all those all those plates growing it. And and that's that that's one of the things that comes to mind. That the person that I mentioned that work in a zoo, uh Sometimes, you know, she said that at the beginning it was an adjustment, you know, like uh, working cultures to say from chickens and seeing so much salmonella, you know, like you're trained with the human population. You see that, you know, you report, it goes through this whole process. And so it's always, it's very interesting, right? Seeing what's pathogenic somewhere, you know, it's commensal in another species. And it's, to me, that's just, you know, uh, very fascinating. Um, and that's well, you know, it's another good point yes. with the, Oh, sorry. And that's another good point with the commensal uh, camp. We expect that to be a pathogen pretty much in any human, and it can be passing through a dog at any point in time. So there's debate on what things are commensals versus actually causing disease. And right away, that makes me think of dogs and Campylobacter. Campy jejuni, no one's really debating that one, but Upsaliensis and just some of those other species. It's, it's a really interesting field, and there's so much opportunity to learn and continue to grow and contribute to the field yeah interesting indeed yeah and they they create so much work in the in human medicine especially in the summer you know people start doing the outdoors and maybe not with COVID after COVID not so much but summertime especially in smaller labs it was a very busy time where you were just especially if there if you had to do manually fill out the paperwork and send everything to the state it was just you know some very busy times during the summer yeah. Well, uh, there, yes. I was going to say, I think there's a, you know, a, another unique aspect of veterinary medicine is really this um, focus on one health um, initiatives. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, but it's basically kind of saying that, you know, you have humans and you have animals and you have your environment and they're all interconnected. And so what affects one is going to have an impact on the other. And I think I feel like it is very evident in veterinary medicine um, how that idea or how what we are doing as MLSs does impact um, One Health. Um, you know, if you have cattle that are sick, you know, they say, say now we have our anthrax outbreak, right? in cattle in North Dakota, if if we aren't reporting those in a timely manner, we aren't getting the, those results communicated both to the veterinarian, the rancher, as well as state health officials, you know, the animals aren't being disposed of properly, which then goes on to impact, you know, the environment, which then goes on to lead to, you know, further anthrax outbreaks in the future. Um, so you just really do see this whole global perspective um, in veterinary medicine in almost in almost any every case um, you can see how you know your dog having um, an ESBL producer could maybe cause an impact to that animal's owner um, depending on um, hygienic practices within the home um, you know so it's it's a very cool aspect and a very interesting way of following, you know, a pathogen throughout, you know, its life cycle. Yeah, it does. It does sound fascinating. And there's, de you know, there's definitely a, a connection, right? And we know about, you know, how, you know, the, the organisms and then the water. And so it's everything. It's, it's, 
it's connected antimicrobial resistance, you know, and how the organisms, you know, via plasma, they pass with resistant to another. And there's, yeah, there's a lot of, of connection. Um, is there anything else that uh, either of you want to add? I think it's covered pretty well. Um, definitely an excellent avenue for someone who would love to marry their love of science and the medical laboratory and veterinary medicine. There are a lot of opportunity in the field. Okay. And you are uh, currently hiring people? We are not currently hiring, but um, we do have retirements uh, just like in the medical laboratory science field. We are always just waiting for that retirement. We're hitting that. I, I know for me, when uh, I was looking to join the field, my advisors were, it's a great time to get in. The biggest generation will be retiring. There's so much opportunity. And I would say we are still in the midst of that. Um, we're losing some very experienced individuals and you know, eventually we'll need to be hiring. So. Okay. Yeah, that's how, yeah, and then that happens in all aspects of the, on all areas of the lab. And certainly was for me when I came in, you had a lot of techs, you know, they've been doing it for 20, 30 years, very hard to get a job on first shift. So you have to kind of work the second or the third just to be in the department waiting for something. And then retirements, people started leaving and then all these openings. And so, yeah, there are some, some cycles to that. Uh, well, you know, uh, Sarah and Kelly, you know, it's it's been great. Uh, again, like I mentioned before off the air, you know, I, I've really been wanting to do this for a long time and learn about what happens in a veterinary lab and in microbiology. So this has been so great. So thank you so much for taking the time to coming into Let's Talk Micro. Thanks for having us. You bet. My pleasure. And that, my dear audience, it's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoy learning about veterinary microbiology. As always, I enjoy sharing this information with you. So always, you know, try to bring that passion to what you do. And I hope that as we progress, as we bring more awareness about this profession of medical laboratory sciences, that we can start mitigating some of those factors. You know, it's always very unfortunate, very sad when we experience burnout and we lose people in the profession that we need so desperately, you know, to that. So I hope that, you know, that can change in the future. So please bring that passion to what you do. It's so important. You know, we do such great work and stay tuned. Great things coming your way. So as always, Stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro. Until the next time, bye.